Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to present a slightly different version of uh, the history of Australia. I'm going to concentrate mostly on low-level laser therapy. Uh, this is partly because laser surgery is very widely accepted. It's almost taken for granted that laser surgery will be part of the whole practice of medicine, whereas la low-level laser therapy is still very controversial, and that's why I have um, on my slide several of the descriptors that will give some insight into where the situation is in Australia. There are conflicts, there are contradictions, there are conundrums, there's confusion, uh, but we also have some congratulations as well. It isn't all that bad. The history probably is focused in 1994 on the fact that our National Health and Medical Research Council published a, uh, a statement saying that uh, LLT is a modality whose effectiveness is unproven and that it is the responsibility of those using the therapy to provide the evidence. And this really has set the tone for the lack of acceptance of LLT in Australia really from that time on. It is generally not accepted at tertiary level medicine and so we have several historical issues in Australia that we're dealing with because of that particular publication. And it relates to the regulation of laser therapy practice, to the issues around education and about communication amongst people who are practicing and using low-level laser therapy. I might also add, which I haven't there, are legal ramifications. Uh, we are second only to New York in Australia, and in Sydney in particular, to um, medico-legal, uh, I suppose, medico-legal challenges on medical practice. So most doctors practice very defensively in Australia. Uh, as I said, coming second, or, and, and in some of the data, actually more, um, more than the US, we are really uh, having to watch ourselves a lot of the time. Now, with regard to regulation, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is the organisation that uh, published the review of laser therapy in 1994, registers devices for use, and in particular, advertising claims for laser devices. And the situation in Australia is, that, is such that nobody can sell a laser and make any claims for that laser unless it's based in evidence, which means that there are very, very few low-level laser therapies available in Australia. One has to import them for what is called personal use only, and this is equivalent to using off-label off drug therapies. So one takes a degree of risk by using lasers for which there is no indication on the register. The uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration also develops guidelines for practice. Uh, and this is not related to the evidence for efficacy, but it is related mostly to the s safety aspects. And it applies mostly to class 3B and class 4 lasers. And it relates really to the issue of regulation and, and education. Who should practice what? Should a dentist treat leg ulcers? Should a podiatrist treat neck pain? Should a beauty therapist offer uh, treatment for back pain and neck pain as part of their beauty therapy? So we have these uh, issues about regulation uh, completely unresolved, and that's part of the conflict within the Australian system. And this is, part, this is also some of the contradictions. In Queensland, these, these are the states, as you can see, in Queensland, there is reg regulation for uh, uh, class 3B and class 4, which requires owners and users to have licenses. It requires laser registration and laser room registration. But in New South Wales, there's absolutely no registration at all. So you can pretty much do anything you want. Anybody can go out and buy a laser and use it, even uh, uh, given that there are guidelines for the use of uh, safety aspects of the laser, but there is no accreditation process. 
um, and I will show you one of the conundrums shortly. And in Victoria, there's no certification. So if you want to bring a laser in and you want to treat anybody or a patient can buy it, you can do it yourself. Tasmania requires certification for uh, users of laser. South Australia, there's no certification. Western Australia also requires laser users to uh, have an accreditation exam, 3B and 4. And the Northern Territory, no certification. So you can see there's a complete lack of consistency, another C that I should have put on my list across the regulation in the country. A contradiction, though, and a conundrum, is that in New South Wales, a laser pointer above one milliwatt requires a firearms um, uh, licence, and it costs $122 to carry a laser pointer of more than one milliwatt. Um, and this is because lasers have been shone at aeroplanes and into train drivers' eyes, and, um, and uh, people use them to identify... Um, it, Muggers will use them to identify a person who has money f uh, with a partner who goes then and attacks them without being seen. So these are illegal weapons in New South Wales, but you can actually go and buy a, a 500 milliwatt laser with no problem at all. Uh, education is an issue, and at the moment there is an, a vacuum in Australia as far as education goes. I should say that it's appropriate that I'm almost at the end of the, the session because we are certainly one of the youngest countries in the world with one of the smallest populations per square kilometre. So uh, we, we have the least history, one might say. Uh, so we have a vacuum. There are ad hoc courses by some societies and organisations. Uh, there is one industry level course, um, but there is a conflict of interest when uh, organisations and industries run courses and sell their lasers, and that presents problems for us. Um, Penny Smalley isn't here, but Penny Smalley has been one of the most influential people in contributing to education of laser safety in hospitals, and she's been coming to Australia from the US to the, for the last 15 years, and has contributed as one in, as a significant individual. But we are still concerned about who should teach what to whom. We have beauty therapists teaching doctors and physiotherapists. Uh, we have uh, acupuncturists teaching relatively high level laser therapy. So we have significant problems for which we must write our own history. So in spite of all these problems, we have all these laser groups using lasers in some way or another. Uh, acupuncturists were amongst the first to use low-level lasers, uh, probably from the early 70s, but these were all very low power, one milliwatt, two milliwatts, silver bar lasers. Uh, the racehorse trainers know very well that they will get their racehorses back racing very quickly, as well as the greyhound trainers. So this um, under-the-radar use is very common amongst these groups. Beauty therapists are using lasers for whatever they want to do. Um, even class four lasers are not restricted. Beauty therapists can use them in Australia. So you can see uh, what a range of people use them. And yet we call this the silo paradigm. These are wheat silos. Everybody is in their little silo. Nobody is talking to anybody else. And nobody knows really what anybody else is doing. So we have this silo paradigm that we need to overcome in some way. So in 2002, and again, I'm, I note that many of the laser associations that have already been presented here today were formed in the 80s. So we are probably 20 years uh, behind some of the organisations uh, of much longer standing. And we, we chose to try and form this as an interdisciplinary organisation. So we wanted to try and include as many of the health professions that we can. And believing that if we can get everybody talking, we might be able to solve some of the problems to do with education and standards. So we, were, we formed in order to promote and encourage and provide for the advancement and effective regulation and practice of laser medicine and to advance the interest and protect the, uh, to advance and protect the interests of persons engaged in the pursuit and practice of laser medicine, etc., and to improve the general standard of practice. And there are other aims at our website. But uh, this organisation is 
trying to put some consistency and reduce the confusion and the conflicts uh, of laser practice in Australia of low-level laser therapy. However, there are some signs where there is um, congratulations to be to be given. Um, Professor Neil Pillar from Flinders University in, in Adelaide has the largest group that has uh, undertaken the study of uh, post-mastectomy lymphedema. They have now 10,000 patients. This is the only, I believe, the only uh, university in the world that has done such in-depth uh, study and uh, he, uh, Neil Pillar is constantly publishing in this area and Australia has led the way. This is an Australian specialty, you might say. And in fact, uh, as a result of this work, uh, the world's first laser for the treatment of lymphedema, post-mastectomy lymphedema, has been registered with the US FDA. And uh, that was, um, I think, uh, two years ago. And they've completed the only randomised double-blind uh, uh, trial of uh, this 904 nanometer laser for the treatment of lymphedema. And uh, it's actually sold for personal use for the patients to treat themselves as well. Uh, another area is uh, Dr. Lisa Laxo, who's a physiotherapist at Griffiths University, uh, which is in Queensland. She was one of the first physiotherapists, in, in fact, probably the first physiotherapist who completed a PhD in laser therapy in 1994. So she was a trailblazer. Some of you might remember her work on beta endorphins uh, and uh, uh, that is her, one of her areas and she is looking into breast cancer uh, and the oncology uh, of low level laser therapy and its effects. Uh, our unit at the um, Sydney University, the Brain and Mind Research Institute and the Nerve Research, uh, Research Foundation received a government grant last year uh, of um, 300 plus thousand dollars to investigate the effects of lasers on nerves and uh, we were one of the first groups ever to be given a grant for this and we're continuing this work looking at how the effects of lasers on nerves are implicated in the relief of pain. These are the dorsal root ganglion neurons. This is one of the areas we are working in. And the University of Melbourne uh, recently received a grant to study the uh, laser acupuncture in knee osteoarthritis and they have a grant uh, for $700,000 that will take uh, three years and that is specifically looking in that area. Um, so the goals for us in AMLA is, is really to create our own history. We have no um, international conferences at this stage and we of course are aiming to improve interdisciplinary communication and develop guidelines for scope of practice and to standardise education and regulation across the states to promote research and to develop guidelines for appropriate relationships with industry. So we are protected and we, we maintain evidence-based practice rather than eminence-based practice. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much.